Alrighty, News Talk 1110 and 99.3 FM WBT and 106.3 WORD. We welcome back to the program Congressman Dan Bishop from North Carolina's 9th Congressional District. And uh, Congressman, how are you, sir? I'm great, Pete. Good to talk to you. Well, thanks for making time, and I appreciate that. And so tell us, why did you sign on to the Texas complaint against uh, Georgia, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania? Uh, why would you do that? And then we'll kind of go into the rationale. But why, why initially did you sign on with 105 other Republican Congress members? Because, Pete, it is an important effort to protect the way our our elections are supposed to operate under the Constitution. That is to say, and, and frankly, the Texas effort is the is in this post-election aftermath is the first effort to come along that sort of assembles everything the right way, in my view. Um, the Constitution says in Article 2, Section 1, that election procedures will be for for the election for president will be set will be established by state legislatures it's very specific about that and in all of the swing states democrats led by mark elias the famous uh, lawyer for the democrats uh, went into states and litigated and and then got bureaucrats and executive officials to change the laws that were established by the legislatures of the states in case after case, and in several of the states, that appears to have opened the door to other you know, the, the violations of ballot security that led to a change in the outcome. And that's got to be resisted. That's got to be responded to, or that section of the Constitution will effectively be nullified. So what of the federalism argument that you're, you're, what we're seeing is Texas trying to tell other states how they need to be running their elections. Is that a fair argument? No, for two reasons, Pete. First of all, Texas doesn't seek to tell them how to, what procedure to use. Texas seeks to enforce the rule that applies to all states in this electoral college, and that is every state has to have an elected legislature set its rules. The rules can differ. It's not a question of what rules they use. It's a question of who set those rules in those specific states. That's the first point. There's another federalism point here, too, Pete. What Nancy Pelosi and Democrats want to do, and they did in, in this past session of Congress, their first bill, H.R. 1, was for Congress to take over all, setting all election procedure. And that's a step they want to do on the way to universal mail-in ballots, uh, popular election of the president discarding the electoral college. Um, if this section of the Constitution that says state legislatures will set the rules can be overrun in the way it has been in this election, then there, there's no way to put that genie back in the bottle. The only answer would be for Congress to take over setting all of the rules. Otherwise, this chaos would prevail uh, election after election, and every election will be stolen in the same way. So why isn't North Carolina part of this lawsuit? North Carolina had the same sort of, uh, you know, history here, right? We got sued by Mark Elias and some Democratic groups, and they entered into this agreement with the Board of Elections, and uh, and then that went to court. So why, why not put North Carolina into this uh, into this basket as well? Well, Texas could do that. Uh, one answer for it, though, is that in North Carolina, just as in every one of these other cases, the effort was by Democrats. The effort was by, again, it was led by Mark Elias. There were Democrat officials that caved into it, except in Georgia. The, the Republican official caved in there. But in every case, it was an effort by Democrats to to sabotage the safeguards on uh, absentee ballots by mail. And so the difference in North Carolina is the result was so substantial for President Trump that it did not overcome what we call the margin of fraud. They, yes, Mark Elias was able to, in North Carolina, achieve a collusive settlement with Attorney General Stein, a Democrat, and the State Board of Elections dominated by Roy Cooper's Democrats. And they got a state Democrat judge to bless that settlement, but it didn't produce enough change 
to have the outcome they desired. So they didn't succeed. In other words, it didn't make the difference. But in all these in, uh, in these other states, in Michigan and Pennsylvania, the Texas petition does a pretty good job of explaining how those that sabotage of election law did change the outcome. So that's that's the reason I think. So how come all of the previous courts that have looked at all of these lawsuits over the last few weeks? And I've been supportive, like, take them to court. Like, let's see all the evidence, make your cases. How come the Trump campaign has lost, like, all of these cases? If if this is so obvious and it's and it's demonstrably so, why haven't they been successful? I believe, Pete, that uh, one of the problems all along and that I've been watching as this has come along is that there is a – there's a – Seemingly, people are attracted to, and, and some of the Trump lawyers or the other folks who are out there saying they're bringing lawsuits have been attracted to the idea of voter fraud, things that people are doing to to cheat. This is a little different. It's connected, but it's different. The idea of illegal votes, votes that came in because procedures were changed without state legislative assistance, I just think it's it's the most salient, significant argument. That's one reason. I think the focus has been wrong uh, in the Trump-led, Trump campaign-led litigation efforts, number one. And number two, I think there's another big point here, Pete. And I think everybody who wants to see uh, the abuse in this election corrected should be very realistic about what lies ahead. I think that it will be very unusual that a court will be prepared to do what the law requires. Uh, it, the, what the suit calls on is to not is to enjoin bar that is the certification of the election result in multiple states. Mm-hmm. Uh, standing up for the rule of law to that end, to that result, is going to be very difficult. It will require a great deal of courage, and whether or not our United States Supreme Court has that courage, we'll have to see. But I think in many cases, I, I could even could cite you a, an opinion out of the Wisconsin Supreme Court that suggested that the merits didn't matter. Uh, no one could ask the court to go. You know, it's, it's, a, it's an astonishing thing to ask the court to go and do that. And yet the Constitution does contemplate that those situations can come to pass. So I think that's what the rule of law requires. I think if, it, if a court doesn't have the courage to, to do that, the the part of the Constitution that confers this authority upon state legislatures will be effectively written out of the Constitution, and this conduct will go on every election until and unless Congress steps in to completely regulate the election procedure, which would, I think, undermine federalism. So I only have about 30 seconds, but uh, former Governor Pat McCrory asked, why didn't the Trump campaign make these arguments before now? Why has it taken this long and for Texas to do it? I can't speak to that. I mean, I, I think <laughs> Fair in enough. this case, you're, 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 you're in an aftermath of an election. There's a lot of uncertainty, and facts have to be gathered from a lot of disparate places, and things happen in slightly different ways. And but, you know, at the end of the day, this is not a Trump campaign effort. This is the state of Texas. And there are even questions about how to present this argument the best way to the United States Supreme Court. So uh, it's easier said than done. Congressman uh, Dan Bishop, I do appreciate your time. Thanks so much uh, and have a great weekend. Thanks, Pete.